Hey guys, it's Tony here at GameFreeBlog again, bringing you another video. This is going to be the first in the brief series that I'm going to look at um, regarding Assassin's Creed Origins. And trying to look at it from a bit more of an Egyptological perspective. So just to go into the actual game and the districts of the game and have a look at the characters. And just have a quick chat about what it means from an Egyptological context. Uh, in the real world, when I'm not making gaming videos, uh, I'm an Egyptologist. I'm a postgrad researcher at the University of Liverpool in uh, England. And um, I'm a massive Assassin's Creed fan. So, of course, when this game came out, it was the two loves of my life essentially tied in. And I thought it would just be a good little diversion just to go into the game and have a look at some of the mythology, have a look at some of the towns, have a look at some of the districts that feature in the game and talk to them more from a bit of an Egyptological perspective. This is going to be the first one that I'm going to look at in this video today. I'm going to do a few more of these um, regarding the main centres that feature in the game and some of the main characters and talk about those. Uh, but of course, if there's anything, if you enjoy the video and there's anything else that you want to see, um, just obviously put a mention in the comments, just say I'd like to know a little bit more about this or I'd like to know a little bit more about that and hopefully uh, I can jump in and fill you in on some more details. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much um, detail if you like because one could spend a ludicrous amount of time so uh, I'm just going to give like a brief overview of the districts and a brief overview of the, the, the characters and the time periods and things like that in the game just to give you a bit more knowledge about the game which you can contrast to the actual material that you're learning while you're playing it I understand some of you may have a bit of knowledge about this stuff anyway just from general history uh, but I just thought it'd be a fun little uh, exercise just to go into the game and uh, have a look around so uh, we are of course playing as Bayek the uh, hero of Siwa protector of Egypt and uh, the game is set during the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic times. Uh, I believe it's Ptolemy the 13th. It's around the time of Cleopatra anyway. And uh, so we're just going to jump in and have a look at Siwa. Oh. So here we're running around Siwa at the moment, uh, and Siwa was one of several oases which were incorporated into a G Egypt proper. Um, not specifically attached to Egypt, but used as kind of vassal states, uh, essentially. The main uh, oases in Egypt were Bahariya, uh, Farafa, El Dakla and El Karga. And Siwa was one of the far oases which was right over in the western desert, almost on the Libyan border. Um, now, Siwa was known, uh, most of these oases were known because they produced really valuable crops, obviously with having a big uh, water system there and access to water. Um, some of the crop growing was absolutely first rate, so they would grow lots of crops such as uh, dates and grapes. And as I said, Siwa was the most um, remote western location uh, that fell under Egypt's control. It was right out in the desert. Um, we know certain bits about Egypt and Siwa uh, within the Egyptological context. Uh, the Pharaoh Cambyses campaigned there in 525 BC, um, which was, um, th th there was rumoured that they were, they'd found some of his army buried out there. And also, of course, Alexander the Great. Um, Alexander the Great took Egypt in 332 BC and he was known to have journeyed to um, Siwa to consult the Oracle of Ammon. Now this probably isn't the Amun of the Egyptian gods originally. Now, Ammon was um, venerated by Libyan desert tribes and he was like a, a horned god if you like. And of course this fit really really well with the Egyptian god Amun. Uh, and so when the Egyptians went over there Basically, Amun got assimilated into Amun, and that's what the big uh, Amun temple is that you can see on the screen now that we're um, investigating. So, um, Alexander consulted the oracle there. Um, Siwa was basically populated since Paleolithic times, so you're talking just very, very small settlements, but there are known contexts from different... Uh, 
um, settlements and people living out there. But it wasn't really until the 26th dynasty that Siwa was colonised and then it remained under Egyptian control from then then on, which, you know, this is kind of like the basis of the game here. It's lots of lots of Greek temple, Greekish temples. Um, the, the current population of Siwa is now Berber-speaking and its location, uh, which is nearest to Libya, um, means that the population was probably more Libyan than Egyptian originally. Um, there are certain texts where the Egyptians kind of allude to the Libyans and this kind of being Western brothers almost. They, they, they thought of them as being the same per people. Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of thing that allowed the Egyptians to go out there and dominate uh, and basically take over the area. Um, now these, not just Siwa, but all of the other um, oases were really important for trade links to remote areas. Now obviously if you were going campaigning somewhere uh, to find whatever it is that you wanted to find, you would need little pit stops along the way where you could you know, refuel w with uh, water, with food, you could rest your uh, donkeys or whatever caravan was going out there. And that's why these um, oases were really important for trade links. Um, the Oasis settlements were also Egyptian outposts which were created to essentially control Libyan, Libyan infiltration into Egypt, um, which is kind of what you're seeing in, in the game here. There are lots of other um, Egyptian fortresses that actually went into um, Libya proper. So there's a very famous fort called Zawiat Um El Rakam, which was built by Ramesses II. And again, that was more... It, when we think of forts it, from a Western context, we kind of think of these really big castles to stop invaders coming in. Now, the, the Egyptian forts were part of that, but they were part economical as well. They would have... Um, villages and there were trade and everything that were going on around the outsides of them so you shouldn't really think of these things as being big imposing stamps on the on the landscape which they were they did act as kind of deterrents but to run these um, um, fortifications and outposts you needed an economy there uh, to help it run which I think Assassin's Creed has done really well essentially as, a, around the Temple of Amun here there's lots of houses lots of settlements lots of markets and everything going on which was probably um, exactly how it was back in the day um, nice little shimmy up the rope there um, so yeah during the Ptolemaic times uh, Siwa was known as Sechet Imu which literally means the field of trees and it probably gives you an idea of what the area was actually like and why they went out there and built because it was already green it was already fairly natural it, there was already resources to draw on from there um, and that was during the Ptolemaic period um, Siwa um, may derive from the Berber word Sewech, which is um, a Berber tribal name. Um, the etymology of that isn't exactly clear, but you know it, it pretty much sounds like it's along the right lines. Um, so that's pretty much the look at Siwa there. Um, not really inhabited throughout the Pharaonic period, not really until the later periods did it come to fruition and turn into the place which we are seeing in the game now. And I think what the game does really, really well is gives an idea of exactly what these places would look like in the time periods that they're at. Lots of it hasn't really changed from what rural Egypt looks like at the present day if you go out into some of the districts in Egypt it looks more or less exactly the same how it would have done um, back then which is a real testament to the uh, designers of the game I, I, I think they really really did their homework on this and one of the little things that I like doing is just wandering around Siwa and just looking at people farming just looking at the day-to-day -day activities um, it's just one of those games that you can just put on and not really do anything you can just walk around Siwa uh, go and visit the temple if you fancy a bit of a ruckus uh, as we're doing here going down to the lake for a little bit of a sail around um, so that's Siwa that's the look at the first district in Assassin's Creed Origins
So now we're going to look at the Magi, the name of the character that Bayek is actually taking the mantle of. Um, in the game, Bayek essentially plays some kind of protector of Egypt, some kind of like mythical um, uh, warrior cast, if you like. And the reality of the Magi is kind of not really there. Um, the first att attestation of the Magi comes from the Old Kingdom, and it comes from a biography in, of an individual called Weni. Weni served under three kings of the Sixth Dynasty, and in his biography he tells that an army was raised to battle against the Asiatics, and the army was comprised of troops from uh, Wawat, Yam, Urtjet and Meja Nubians and this is where the word Meja comes from. They were based, they were essentially nu a Nubian tribe in the early periods. The text also says that um, wood for barges was also cut by the Meja people and this essentially shows that if they weren't more or less subjugated by the ancient Egyptians then they had some kind of the Egyptians had some control, they could exert this control on them so they could get wood and they could get resources and use them as essentially troops in the Egyptian army. This lasted until the, that's basically all the attestations from the earlier period. There might be another one or two but uh, it's not really important for what we're talking about. Um, Moving on to the Middle Kingdom, the, the Meji was specifically referred to as being a tribe rather than a, than a land. So they were essentially a tribe of people rather than a district down in Nubia. Um, there is a um, famous instruction written to his son by the King Amenemhet I, which is, has been preserved in several manuscripts, and it refers to a Nubian war where the king states, I have repressed those of Wawat and I captured the Meji. So this is a specific, you know, instance of him saying that he captured this tribe. Um, now, under Senwazret I, another uh, Middle Kingdom king, uh, an individual named Saranput was appointed the governor of Elephantini Island, which is a, a small island that sits on the border of Egypt and Nubia. Um, the biographical inscription on his tomb, uh, he mentions that his duties um, included the delivery of Meje, which were possibly delivered there as servants. So this is another attestation of the Meje being a kind of a, a person rather than a district. Um, the 12th dynasty, sorry, 11th dynasty king, uh, Mentahotep um, II, built a chapel at Dendera. And the inscription at Dendra reads, clubbing the eastern lands, striking down the hill countries, trampling the deserts, making the Nubians pay tribute, uniting Upper and Lower Egypt, the Meje, the Libyans and the marshlands. So it st still seems here that the Meje were seen as a tribe um, rather than anything kind of ind individualistic that you kind of see in the game. Um, there's also another group of really important documents which came from a fortress which was stationed as, more or less as far into Nubia as you, as, as you can get really, with still being in, in Egyptian control. Um, now these documents are known as the Semna Dispatches, there was a, a fortress in the area of Semna and these dispatches essentially tell of groups of wandering people in the desert and the Egyptians were kind of keeping a watch on these guys making sure they knew what they were up to at any one given time and as I mentioned before with the um, the, the temples and the outposts in the different uh, oases um, this fortress acted as a bulwark against possible military action from Nubia but it was also a trading post and lots of the text that you do find there specifically mention Nubians coming to trade at the trading post and wanting to be let into Egypt to trade. Um, the dispatches deal with the comings and goings of Nubians which were um, Nehesiu, that was the Egyptian word for the Nubian, and Meje people. That Now they weren't allowed uh, to pass if they were found roaming the desert by the Egyptians. Um, one communication specifically details finding several Meje, uh, men and women, who have come from a well that was probably in the desert. So these people were found wandering around in the desert but close to the fortress. And there's another dispatch that details that two Meje men, three Meje women and two possible children, the, the, the text cut short there, um, came to the, the fortress to see if they could serve the pharaoh. 
um, when they came to the fortress, they were asked the condition of the desert. You know, how how is the desert? How is it all out there? And these uh, Meje answered that the desert is dying of hunger. So they were essentially, you know, more or less starving out in the desert. They couldn't get anything to eat, anything to trade. So they came to this um, outpost to see if they could get do work for Pharaoh, essentially. And anyway, the Egyptians um, dismissed them out into the desert, never to be heard from again. There's a few more Middle Egyptian contexts, but the um, the main bulk of what the Meje role actually was comes from the New Kingdom. So you're talking, you know, the time of Ramesses. Um, slightly earlier than that, I mean, the Meje seem to take the role as a security force. If you want to use a kind of westernized term for it, the usual way of, of, of translating the word Meje in this context is by police. I think that has too many kind of Western <laughs> connotations on it. Um, if you want to use that term, that's kind of a good shorthand to use them. But essentially, the Meje used to protect um, cities and cemeteries and the, the borders of Egypt. And they were extremely well known for being um, uh, guards and having access to the workers' village at Deir al Medina. Now, this workers' village was the village that housed the workers that carved the tombs in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. And these Meje were essentially patrolling the outskirts of these villages and making sure no one would sneak up, uh, try and rob any tombs, that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the Meje also played a really considerable role in the Egyptian War of Liberation against the Hyksos in the 18th dynasty. Now this is where the Hyksos were essentially, you know, invading Europe and taking control of it. And the, new, the, the Meje helped the Egyptians kick them out and take it, um, the country back. So in the 19th and 20th dynasty, Meje, the Meje were seemingly completely Egyptianized. So they were initially Nubians in the earlier days, but they seemed to, if they weren't Egyptian anyway, lots of them would have taken Egyptian names. So you had really good Egyptian names like Amenhotep, Nesamun, uh, Keniamun, uh, and these people um, were also listed as labour personnel in, in a few documents and they were listed as transporting monuments for Ramesses IV. Um, the chief Meje as well as the subordinate Meje are listed in Papyrus Turin 93 um, and this essentially states that there are six chief chiefs and 18 Meje totaling 24. Now there's a part of the document that is lost uh, but it seems like there were three, me um, three Meje to each chief and this document is dated to year 17 of Ramesses the ninth uh, and this was when large-scale tomb robberies were really happening all over the uh, Theban necropolis and these Meje were kind of like a, more or less increased so they could come in and take care of these robberies that were going on so pretty tough pretty you know men that could take care of business that's what you want to try and think about the Meje as um, the chief task um, was to guard the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens uh, there's one text where the chief Me Meje, Mini, M Mini Enwi, I, can, I always get this wrong, Mini Enwi, wrote to the vizier of Egypt stating, I acted as the Meje in the west of Thebes and guarded the walls of his great palace. I was appointed the chief of the Meje, an excellent reward because of my good behaviour. So that gives a little hint about the role of the Meje and what they were actually appointed to do. Um, in the reign of Ramesses IV, there is another text which states, The two chiefs of the Medje came, saying, The people who are enemies have come. They have reached Per Nabi. They destroyed all that was and buried all its people. The high priest of Ammon said to us, Bring the Medje of Per Nabi and those in the south and those of the necropolis and make them stay here to watch the tomb. So when the, there was essentially a kind of like little civil war and the Meje were brought in to guard these tombs. They were so important to the royal family that this is what the Meje were essentially there for. You're talking, you know, people that were crack shots, crack archers, uh, the toughest houses, let's say. Well, that's what I say anyway. Um, the Meje were also really heavily involved in trade at Deir al Medina. Now, the, in the... Um, New Kingdom, Egypt wasn't a monetary economy. Lots of things that you would trade and barter had a monetary value, but there was no such thing as coinage. Everything had an equivalent weight of gold, silver, copper, sometimes even grain as well. 
and the the Meiji were really really involved in lots of this trade that was going on they also acted as witnesses in business transactions uh, they interrogated people who were found to be doing naughty naughty things and they also dished out lots of punishment as well um, the Meiji could also sit on the Kenbet the Kenbet was almost like a village court where the the big men of the village would get together and try and sort out disputes between people and Meiji were known to have sit on that court uh, to help kind of like sort out any problems with the workforce. Um, uh, they also um, investigated thefts in the necropolis and reported the findings straight to the vizier. So to have the ear of the vizier, vizier in ancient Egypt was, you, you know, you had to be someone of relative status to do that and the Meiji did have that kind of um, access. Um, now, unlike the workers at Deir al-Medina, so the workers at Deir al-Medina were, were state workers, they were paid by the state, uh, and we're not talking paid as in a, a wage packet, they were paid in uh, emma and barley, so they could make bread and beer, uh, everything they essentially needed to live. There's records of the workmen being paid, but the Meiji weren't. They, on, on any documents of being paid by the state whatsoever, uh, they didn't receive any official rations they seem to also live outside of the village, so nobody from the Meiji lived inside the, the workers' village at Deir al-Medina. They all lived outside in the wider Theban necropolis. And um, there are small, there's a small group of houses out in the desert, right near the Temple of Seti I, where the Meiji uh, lived. There are several named Meiji uh, who are known to have had houses uh, there. Now this gave them access to the out, outer Theban necropolis, so if you think you've got a relatively secluded workforce in the village of Deir al-Medina that were working for the king, there were state workers, um, I won't go into this too much, but there's, there's a debate on the access that these workers had to the outer Theban area. And so what it seems from the, the economical text is that the Meiji uh, acted as middlemen. They could essentially broker deals between people that lived outside of the village of Deir al-Medina in the Theban necropolis, so the general population. And then they could actually go into the village and carry on another part of this trade. So they acted as middlemen. And lots of these people, made, lots of the Meiji, they made quite lucrative livings. They, they were really well-known donkey traders, so they owned lots of donkeys. Animals were, were quite pricey uh, in ancient Egypt. And so the Meiji had enough disposable income, if you like, to be able to buy, um, sell and exchange donkeys for other, um, uh, for other items, you know, whatever it is that they wanted to get. Um, so the Meiji essentially carried on with this act um, all the way through the, the, the Ramesside period, really, up until the, when Deir al-Medina essentially fell. Um, and after the 20th dynasty, the term Meje, the actual word Meje, disappears from the record. Now, this is either by a name change, so they may have been known by something else, but what they could have been changed their name to isn't actually known at this minute, or the actual occupation was completely dissolved. It was just found out that the, the Meje weren't needed anymore. All of the tombs in the Theban necropolis had been robbed. There was no need for security, um, and so the Meje were essentially disbanded. And in the game, obviously I've, I've blabbered on a, a little bit about that, but uh, in the game the Meiji have this kind of mythological status as, you know, warriors of Egypt, protectors of Egypt. In a kind of way, it's, you know, right, if you, if, if you want to think of it in that way. They did look after the tombs, they had the ear of the vizier, um, they were really heavily involved in exchange in, in the economy. Um, the, the way that it's kind of portrayed in the game, though, that there were this kind, of, there was this cast, if you like, of Egyptian protector, protectors known as the Meje, is kind of taking a thought for a walk a little bit, which is all well and good. You know, it's a fantasy game um, based in reality, but um, that's the Meje for you. <laughs> so I um, hope you've enjoyed this waffling that I've done. It's just a few thoughts that I put down that I just wanted to talk about with Siwa. Uh, and the Meje, just as a slight introduction. As I said, I'm absolutely loving the game. I think it's just a brilliant realization of, of ancient Egypt. Um, it's, it all looks spot on, it all plays spot on. Um, you can actually read the hieroglyphs in the game. 
um, they've done a really really good job of it so I am going to be bringing some more videos um, now that we've um, had a bit of a context to the Meje and Bayex uh, um, occupation and a look at his hometown Siwa um, we're going to be moving on from here so I obviously want to do a couple more looks at a few different things. I'm going to touch on those again when I go into the videos in detail. Obviously, the pyramids at Giza are going to be there. Obviously, Alexandria is going to be there. We're probably going to have a little tour around Memphis as well, um, which isn't too far from the Giza Plateau. Uh, and we're just going to look at those in any context. But as I said, if you've enjoyed this video, thanks for putting up, putting up with my blethering. And uh, thanks for watching the video. If there's anything that you want to know further of, if you feel that I haven't covered anything in detail and you'd like to know a little bit more about it, or you know, you've just got a general question that you think I could maybe answer in a quick five minute video, please leave a message in the comment section. Um, if it's at all possible, I'll just answer your question by means of a video. I'll go to the location in the game, uh, talk about whatever it is that you want to know about. Um, but yeah, thanks for tuning in this video. Um, if you've enjoyed it, do hit the subscribe button because these will be the next few videos that I've got coming up. Um, hope you're enjoying Assassin's Creed Origins as much as I am. And I'll catch you in the next video. This is Tony signing out. Take care and guys. Bye bye.